Hi, everybody. I'm going to get started. Um, I'm Mia, Mia Horrigan, uh, Australia via Ireland, in case the accent sounds really weird to you. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk to you about um, evidence-based management for business agility, because it's something that over the last couple of years, um, I've been working with executives. And what they've been saying to me is like, Mia, we spent hundreds and thousands and millions of dollars on this agile transformation, but how do I know if, we, if, if it's working? And how do I know if we're producing better stuff? Um, I just can't see it. I've got no understanding of that. I mean, you know, has our product delivery improved? Are we got happy customers? Are our business happy? Are our stakeholders happy? Do our employees actually feel more empowered? So has all this money that we've been piling into this thing, is it actually worth it? And the problem that we have is because, and if you were just in Alex's talk, and I know some of you were, it's, this is because this is how we traditionally think about our projects. We have scope, we have budget, we have time. And our success was that we did everything on time, on budget, um, and we delivered all the requirements that up front we agreed to in our contract. And the problem is that we're tracking our project as if it was gonna just follow a nice little plan and it was very, very predictable. Because it assumes that there's gonna be minimal change. We just plan it, we do it, and then we're successful. But the problem is that this forces us to focus on activities and output, but not on the outcomes and the values. And that was the thing that we were missing. We were doing lots of stuff so we could show our CEO, our CIO that, hey, look at all this activity we've done, therefore we must be good. We produced lots of documents, but did we get the output and did we, sorry, did we get the outcomes and did we produce anything that was actually valuable? So value is the reason why we do things in an agile way. And we've really had to shake that triangle up and actually evolve from this traditional mentality that all we have is scope, cost and schedule and we can actually plan that to the nth degree and it'll be fine. In agile, we think, we care more about value and we definitely care about quality. So the things that are our constraints are those scope, cost and time. And we tend to see the scope in our product backlog as the things that we can actually change because as we learn more, we know that what's valuable might change because of what we've learned. So we need to think about things a little bit differently in Agile because what you measure and track today could be very, very different. And what you measure talks a lot about what's important to you, or at least it should. So just next to the person next to you, just for a minute, this is, I promise, not too much interaction. Um, just for a minute, just talk about what are the sort of things that you're tracking right now in your company? What are the things that you say to show you your, what you're measured on? What are the things they ask you to track? So just a minute to talk to the person next to you. You can go in threes if you can't find a friend. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so at least you know the person next to you now, so that's great. Um, what are the sort of things? Anyone happy to shout out? What were the sort of activity, what were the sort of things that you're measuring? Yep, just... Velocity, yep. Yep, so the progress of the project, um, the velocity, and the last one was? Oh, yep, excellent. Any other things? Yeah. Yeah, how are we tracking against the actual and the forecast? Yeah. Plan versus actual? Yeah, so, so you can help improve your forecasting. Cool. Yeah. Time to market, love it, excellent. Great, okay, code quality. Anything else on this side, yeah. Cycle time, cool. Yep. Stability or, or predictability, excellent. Impact on operations. Lead time. 
Oh, you guys have advanced. I can probably go. Get <laughs> no, that's excellent. Because a lot of times when people sort of are thinking about their activities and you ask them to sort of put them on a post-it note, and do this with your teams. Um, do this exercise. Ask them what are we measuring. And ask them to track whether it's an activity, an output, or whether it's actually something that's an outcome or something that's an impact. Because you'll probably find you have a mix of all of them. And uh, you know, the activity outputs and um, have their place at the team level to help you with forecasting and improve and things like that. But are we thinking as an organization about what we want to achieve? And are we thinking about our impact and the actual outcome? Because the activity is just reflecting what we've taken the activities that we've done, the output's just reflecting what we produced. But where we want to get to is, well, what outcome? Did that change our customers thinking about how we're doing things? Did it change users thinking about us as a company? And the impact on the company itself as a result. They're the sort of things, because just measuring activity isn't really telling us if we're delivering value. So yeah, do that activity with your teams and, and, your, and your leadership and just see what you're tracking because what is important um, and what you're tracking are the same thing. So if it's important to you, track it. Because what we find is what we measure is important. And if we're measuring the wrong thing for the wrong reason, we can go down the wrong track. Because typically, our teams are used to, if you're tracking it, it means that it's going to be used against them. And velocity is a classic one. It's called the observer effect. And you can see it in there that, you know, oh, your velocity is not good enough. You need to increase your velocity the teams will game it, and they'll give you a bigger velocity. It won't be meaningful, and they won't be using it the way you were talking about to see if it's forecast versus actual getting better. You've told them more velocity, they give you more velocity. It's not a measure for an organization to be tracking. It's to help the team improve, help get them better at their predictability and their forecasting. The other thing we find is the street light effect. We're counting code. How many lines of code did you deliver? If you didn't deliver enough lines of code, then you mustn't have been productive. Well, just because it's measuring the number of lines of code, does that actually mean that anything you produce was valuable? It could be one or two lines of code that are the most valuable pieces of code you've got. So think about those things um, when you're doing measures, because what you measure is important. And how is value measured? This is from the um, Chaos Report. This comes out every year. Big um, survey of 30,000 odd organizations, big, small, medium enterprises. And what they found was that all of that software that we're producing and the features that we're producing, consistently, 65% of it is rarely used or not used at all. That's a lot of waste. That's a lot of things we're doing um, that haven't produced anything valuable. Something that we produced we, up front, we thought was required, when it got out to our customers, just wasn't something that they were interested in at all and rarely used. We also sometimes think about practices. And if we're doing these you know, new cool practices in DevOps that we're talking about nowadays, you know, are our developers busy? Have we got test automation, continuous automation? We sometimes get focused on the practices and the effectiveness of those. But do they actually mean we're producing value? We need to sort of also think about the next layer. What's the impact that has? Why are we doing that? And can we measure if it's had an effect? Because if we're measuring the wrong things, it could have really undesirable consequences. Because measurement is really strategic. Uh, we have great dashboards we can do with some wonderful tools nowadays. But if we're not measuring value, the success of what we're doing is really just based on our intuition and assumptions. We think it's working. We're not quite sure. But you know, um, we have no idea whether we're actually closer to achieving what our users want and whether we're having an effect. So, oh, sorry, that's, we've done that. OK, so evidence-based management um, is something that it was uh, a couple of years ago, came out with Ken Schwaber. Um, in more recent times, it's kind of been reinvigorated with a, a different thinking around um, the outcomes and the impacts. But it's really about measuring value um, delivered as evidence of organizational agility. And hence, in this Business Agility Day, it's kind of fairly interesting because we're now finding that as businesses want to become agile, they also want to look at metrics across the whole organization that they can actually use to see whether they are agile as an organization. The model is fairly simple. It's um, 
we look at a lot of different quadrants. So up the top, we're talking about customer value, market value, and that's all the things about the current value and the unrealized value. Um, down the bottom, we have the organizational capability. So these are the things that are going to help us achieve those things. And it's our ability to innovate and our time to market. How quickly can we get things out there? And there, they are measures that we can use that help us work out whether we're delivering value or not and to help us guide our improvements. So we're going to drill down into the model in a little bit more detail. It's very much um, fits with that agile model of inspection and adaption. So we measure that key value metrics. We select the key value area that we want to improve. We'll conduct an experiment to improve that value. We'll look at that outcome and results and then keep going. I'm going to talk about a lot of measures today. There's, I think there's about 40 odd measures. If you try to do all 40 at once, when you're successful, you don't know which one it is. So do little mini experiments and work um, out which ones you need and then move on to the next one, trying to tackle it all at once. So let's talk about current value. So this is really the goal is to maximize the value that we have in the present day. It's measuring what you're worth today. It's not thinking about the future value. It's just what you're worth today. Um, and it reveals your actual value in the marketplace. And there's a lot of different measures that you can use to actually help you with that. Some of them are, lead, are leading indicators and some of them are lagging indicators. You know, how happy, hey, how happy are your customers, your stakeholders, your business, your investors? Um, and are you improving or are you going backwards? So the leading indicators that you've got there are things like employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction, and also usage index. So remember that um, chaos report I showed you of 65% of it not even being utilized. What's the usage index of your products when you actually get them out in the marketplace? Lagging indicators that are also helpful here, but unfortunately, because they're lagging, you're not going to see them for a while, are things like revenue per employee and product cost ratios. These costs are really important. I was actually talking at breakfast with Scott, and he was talking about if we measure velocity and it increased, but then it took you extra people to deliver that extra bit of velocity, you've actually increased your costs. And that's something your CEOs and CIOs want to know about because you delivered it, but at what cost? So also think about the revenue per cost because if it's getting too much of your margin is being eaten away because it's taking you more people to actually deliver that extra, is it actually of value anymore? It might be something that's not valuable for that cost. And it really comes down to understanding our customers. So I'm assuming most of you use personas or something fairly similar. Um, really good starting point for your product owners and your teams um, to sort of start to build this picture of who are we really building this for? Uh, you've probably seen those user stories where as a systems developer, I need this, where it's very much focused on the technology and the system. Um, user stories, all about thinking about the user and the value that we're giving them. It's talking about, you know, what's their story? What's the trigger? What's their goal? What's their motivation? And how can we help solve their problems? What do we know are their pain points? Another thing I really like to use when I'm working with teams to kind of work out what um, the value is, is doing the value proposition canvases. What's your value proposition? Um, why do our customers actually want to work with us? Um, you know, it's so hard to get those customers that being in sales and marketing for a long time, um, it takes a long time to woo those customers. If you've got existing customers, you don't want to lose them. They're gold. So why, why do your customers actually want to work with you? Do you know why? Um, what are the outcomes that they actually get from your products? What are the things that really delight them? And how do you measure that? So your value proposition canvas that you've got there looks at all those customer wants and needs that you've got in your personas and the pain points but then looks at, well, how does that match to the product offering that we've got? What are the benefits and what's the match that will get us our value proposition to that customer? Impact mapping, also a really good one in this particular area for looking at current value. Um, and you're starting with the goal. You're thinking about those actors which are represented in your persona. You're looking at the impacts that you've got and then the deliverables. It's very goal driven and you can prioritize your features based on those goals a really good um, way to sort of think about it. And you can then start to track your progress towards the impacts you're having as opposed to just the activities that you're doing. 
And if you've got an existing backlog and you're starting, once you've got your goals, you can actually track it back and validate things as well. I like to actually use the modified impact map um, that Jeff um, Patton um, tends to talk about. And rather than thinking of the goal, persona, impact, and deliverable, he then breaks it down into what's the outcome and how do I get my user stories from that. So you've got that beautiful traceability from your goals all the way down to the PBIs and user stories that you're doing. Um, so, much, so much more impactful. And it also helps you to keep your user stories very outcome focused. So if you've got that outcome focus, it's going to be easier to track what those outcomes actually are. So it's hypothesis driven development. Um, so here's a good way to do it. We believe in doing this, which is your feature, for these people, which will achieve this outcome. And we know that will be true when we see this measurement um, changed. Just a different way of thinking about your user story at a feature level. Because we're running mini hypothesis and mini tests and experiments all the time in an agile environment. Here are the key measures again and some definitions of them for current value. So um, employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction, simple things like just doing a um, uh, sentiment analysis. Very, very powerful stuff. The usage index, how much are we being used? Revenue, which is basically um, your gross revenue divided by your cost, the number of employees, and your production costs. Really, really key things to understand. Let's talk about unrealized value then. So we've talked about what we're currently worth. Let's think about what future might hold for us. And something like um, the opportunity canvases is a really good tool to try and find out what are the opportunities there that if we looked at this idea that we've got, what could that potentially be worth to us? Would our customers actually even like it? Would they value it? What dollars could we get from that? What unrealized potential is out there? And the goal is to actually maximize the value for the organization by bringing in some of those new ideas. Again, there's leading and lagging indicators that you can look with at with um, unrealized value. So um, the key thing here is, you know, in the leading indicators, what are the competitors' strengths and weaknesses? And, and is there an opportunity there for you to capture some market share because of that? What's the customer acquisition or defection? A lot of people leaving a particular um, product because there's a gap in the market, is that something that you can actually fill? So tracking those sort of things is really critical. Lagging indicator is when you actually get your results and your market share. Valuable information, but again, it's a lagging indicator. So having those leading indicators to help guide you is quite critical. Um, and whether the market itself is growing or declining is also an important metric to be tracking for your organization. Because you want to actually know, if I invest money in this, is it actually going to give me a return? Is it actually worth the risk that I'm going to take on, particularly if it's a new or novel market? And there's lots and lots of different ways to think about your um, marketing strategy, but you probably want to get a balance of your current value and your unrealized value, because if you've got all of your money in a cash cow, which you know today, very high value for you as a company, if there's no innovation in that area or any way that you can um, reinvigorate that product, over time, you're, it's a crowded marketplace. There'll be other competitors that are coming into it. So you need to start looking at other things. Um, you've got some uh, dogs in your market that probably are things that are legacy systems that you've got to let go of. They're costing you money. They're taking up time that you could be doing, um, spending it on other things. So think about mapping your products and where they're at in their life cycle in this kind of quadrant. Um, your stars, high current value, um, good high potential for growth. They're excellent. Um, and your rockets are ones that have got really good potential. You might have done a beta or tested something in the market. People loved it. Um, and if you put a bit more money into that, that's going to be a future um, star for you. So think about your, your products in those sort of things to see which are the ones worth pursuing and what um, value can we get from that. There's also the concept um, from Don Wrightson of cost of delay. And this is something that um, I put together for my client who's actually a government agency because we couldn't really quite understand in a government um, situation that we don't sort of have revenue or care about revenue. It's more about compliance and getting people signed up to different programs and things like that. So we had to think about what business value, time criticality, and opportunity enablement meant there. But the key thing in cost of delay is you're actually looking at, if this is valuable, 
what opportunity does it open up for me? And if I put money into that, is that going to be worthwhile versus other things that I currently am doing um, that are business value as well? So thinking about it as cost of delay or WISCHF, which is the formula up the top there, um, helps you understand of, is this worth pursuing? Is this an idea that will actually give me a return if I get it out to market quicker? So when you test your hypothesis for its success, kind of think about things like, how would it take for you to know whether you've actually achieved this? Is it the outcome you wanted to achieve? And is it the impact that you wanted to see? So always be testing your hypothesis and running those mini experiments each and every cycle. And the unrealized value, that market share and the customer user satisfaction gap are the key things that you're looking at in that unrealized value area. Okay, so they're the things that from a customer value point of view, a business value point of view, we think about. When we think about time to market, these are things that as an organization you can actually um, influence in your organization today. So time to market is how fast can we learn from new experiments that we're doing? How fast do we learn from the information that we've gathered to inspect and adapt what we're doing? How fast do we deliver new value to our customers? Because the thing we're trying to do here is actually maximize the amount of time, like, sorry, minimize the amount of time it takes to get to our business value, to get to our goal. Because if we're not maintaining our time to market and thinking about that, we actually could be lagging behind our competitors and we might not be able to sustain the value that we're wanting to get out there. Uh, here's an uh, idea map that we did. We mapped with one of my clients, um, you know, how long and what the cycle was and what were the steps that it took to actually look at um, how we get value and improvements out there. So we started with just the simple ideas, um, you know, applying our strategic filter, understanding the problem, and, but, and then we eventually got it out there, measured our outcome and our trends. But the key thing here was we were always looking at the feedback loop, trying to find out, was that valuable? Do we keep going? Um, have we proved it or not? Okay. Is this something that we want to um, get information on? Because if we're not getting that feedback, it's really difficult to understand um, if, we're, if we're on the right track, if this is actually an idea worth pursuing. And we want to know how long it's going to take us to get it to market. So being able to map that end-to-end -end process is really critical. So how long it takes to get to market, the sort of leading indicators that you're looking at there is the frequency of your build success. Um, build, pass, fail trends, release stabilization trends, um, and the mean time to repair. The lagging indicators, very valuable um, as well, but things that you only find out after the fact, cycle time, release frequency, lead time, and time to learn. Uh, if you've seen um, Jeff Patton's um, talks, I think he was here last year, he talks about time to learn and time to earn, and each of them are equally valuable. So how long does it take you as a company to learn? That's going to influence how long it takes you to get your time to market. Value stream mapping is when you get that end-to-end -end process of what are the steps. Then you actually start to look at, well, actually, end-to-end, -end, what does that look like? What's our current time to market? What bottlenecks am I seeing? What do I need to improve or remove? Is there a lot of waste or technical debt in this? Uh, I know that this example is really small for you to see, but it was mapping um, a particular government agency, and it was an initiative that they had from legislation um, and it actually took 238 days to get from the idea to actually in production. Guess how much, or you can see it on there if you can read really small, guess how long it actually took to actually develop that particular product? About 30 days. So 30 days of actual work by the development team took 230 days to get through that system. But doing this value map was really powerful because we actually were able to show them You've got a bottleneck here in design because you're doing upfront design. You've got a bottleneck here in testing because you're doing enterprise testing after the testers have already done all the functional integration testing. So there was duplication, there was waste, there was a lot of things up here. I'd call this water scrum fall was what they were doing. Their development was agile, but everything else was very, very waterfall. But the value of the value stream map was to actually show them how long it took them time to market to actually get an initiative once it was announced 
gets into production. And the last part of the quadrant is ability to innovate. So that's all about what prevents your organization from delivering new things of value. What are things that are slowing you down? And what your, stops your competitors as a result from benefiting from these new innovations? It's helping you to avoid things that are overloading your system and really thinking about the system perspective. Because we want to get new innovation out here. So these are some of the things that are impeding your development. It's um, inability to hire the right people. Um, maintaining multiple code branches and things like that, um, complex or old application architecture, insufficient um, product-like environments to test on, um, multiple levels of environments to test on, lack of decentralized decision making, lack of operational excellence, and actually spending too much time on fixing bugs and defects and technical debt. That's really, every time you're spending on that, it's stopping you from actually working on innovations. So the leading indicators here, um, and there's quite a lot of them in this particular section because a lot of them are still things that today we're still grappling with. Um, our technical debt trends, our architecture, our defect trends, our production incidents, our downtime, how long is our downtime, uh, number of active branches that we've got, um, that we spend a lot of time merging, um, time spent on context switching. If you're at Doc Norton's talk, you would have seen what happens with context switching and velocity trends that we've got. Some of the lagging indicators are innovation rate, installed um, version index, and usage index. But the success and your ability as an organization to truly innovate are going to be um, determined by how you handle these particular things. Lower the, lowering the cost of support means you can do more um, innovative things. Just an example from that um, organization I talked to you about with that value stream map that we did. Uh, we're two years into our journey, two and a half years now. When we started, we looked at that value map and we identified some areas. If we look at um, this particular one, uh, over the 12 months, in the, if you look at the um, line that says 17Q2, that was the previous release that was done in a very waterfall way. There was no agile development. It was all waterfall. And as you can see, they thought about things in a 12-month program and Towards the end, the three months before the big release, there's a lot of time spent fixing defects. In fact, it took six teams offline for three months just fixing defects because they were identifying things just way too late in the system. Um, the following year in 2018 was when we moved the teams to an agile team. And in this first six month period, uh, this is number of defects per day. We hardly had any defects. Do you know what the um, CEO and C um, IO asked me at that about, you've moved to Agile and I'm not seeing any defects. Do you know what their concern was? That the teams weren't capturing the defects. They said, we've got defects, but the teams aren't writing them up, so this is a problem. We actually didn't have defects because we'd moved to Agile, the teams were picking them up and actually fixing them, so there were no defects to record. The defects that we started to get towards the end were when we were integrating with some other parts of the system outside the, the team's control. But as you can see, the Agile teams dramatically decreased the defects from what they did. The real thing why this is um, quite critical is this was a large program. So this organization has a revenue, we'll call it revenue, of $500 billion a year. To put that in perspective, Google, Amazon, um, and Apple, all about $120 billion. So this is a $500 billion organization. With this initiative and moving to Agile, we actually saved them five to $10 million because the teams weren't doing all this overtime that they previously did to get this over the line. We saved three months of overtime by moving to an Agile way. Teams were much happier, so our happiness index with employee satisfaction went up. People that back here didn't want to join the Agile team because it was scary, it was going to be a change, and they didn't want to do it, they didn't want to leave the team. After that, they were really seeing that I'm getting a good life balance here. I like the work and I'm doing really well and I'm not having to do all that overtime. And the revenue that that particular program brought in extra was 500 billion. So that cost saving and that employee satisfaction were really good hard metrics that we could take to our CEO and say, this is what we can achieve with our job. Really, really powerful message. That organization now 18 months later 
there's six other programs that have moved to agile ways of working. So how much should you spend on innovation? Um, this is some um, Forrester research that comes out that sort of said that in 2010, people were spending about 29% on business innovation. And then when they looked at it again in 2016, 2017, the innovation, innovation rate had gone down um, because the business operation rate was about the same, but there was a lot of, um, a lot of waste in the system where incremental business change was just fixing technical debt and things like that. So the innovation rate, when it's lower, it means that you can get less things um, out there in the marketplace that are actually going to be um, useful for your customers. Uh, what innovation rate is better? Is 52 better than 29? Look, it'll really depend on your industry um, and what it is. 29 is about the average um, that most companies are doing in the industry nowadays. And it depends on your risk appetite as well. So your innovation rate is going to be a combination of all of those. But if you're tracking your innovation rate and you're seeing that it's going down and that your operational costs and fixing and bug fixes and technical debt are going up, that's probably a sign that things aren't going well for you in your ability to innovate. Uh, this is that same organisation that I was talking about. and We've been tracking these teams for about two years. Uh, what we found with that is that um, leadership and culture were really those things that were going to enable you to have a good innovation rate and be able to do continuous improvement. Because the continuous improvement only got um, a little bit better as the team started to mature and as the leadership um, servant leadership of the organisation improved. It took a while for our innovation rate to get to a good spot. So what can you do to improve? Well, really increase your investment in new idea ge generation. Get your executives on board. If we didn't have the executives on board for this particular program, it would have been um, extremely difficult. It was an organisational-wide transformation, so we did have that CEO buy-in and support. Um, get that innovation culture happening. Dedicate actual time for innovation. Um, use outside sources of creativity. If you need to bring in some inspiration or talk to other companies that have done it, bring them in and they can tell you how they've done it as well. Um, develop really good understanding of what your customers are doing so you can help together solve their problems. Think of your customer as, as part of your team. Um, and partner with suppliers for new ideas if you need more inspiration. Because um, you want to lower the cost of supporting your products so you can start to, to invest money in those new ideas that in the future are going to be the future of where your company is going. Uh, we do hackathon days as an example of giving that time to do something innovative. Um, we make sure that we make it very visible on the wall who's done it. And the team can kind of choose who they work with um, and what problem they want to solve. Some of the problems they're solving are things that are tooling that will help them do their work better. Others are process things. They really have quite a wide, um, a wide berth on what they can actually do on the hackathon day. They submit the idea. We don't restrict it. And we have about 10 or 15 teams each and every cycle. So every three months, we do a hackathon day. And people really look forward to it. It's a lot of fun. We are geographically dispersed across every um, uh, capital in Australia. But we also have our team in Manila. So we actually, the Manila team actually always are part of the hackathon. We do it all over WebEx so that everybody can actually see it. Um, it's, it's quite inclusive. And it's something that the team love and they look forward to. If we took it away from them, I think there'd be a bit of a revolt now because they just really get a lot out of it. And some of the things that they've come up with have actually really helped the teams. They've come up with some really cool initiatives. Um, so in conclusion. If you could change just one measure that you're doing today to make it more about the impact that you as an organisation, you know, think about what that would be and really um, think about how you want to improve that so that you're not just measuring your activities. You want to think about what's the outcome that I've delivered. And deciding what to measure is critical. So if you're measuring activities and outputs, that's okay um, as long as you're using them for the right purpose to helping guiding your team or helping you improve with your forecasting, your predictability. But start to think about the things that are the impacts. Start to measure those things as well. Don't just focus on the activities and outputs, the things that might be relatively easier to measure at a team level. 
start to think about those more critical things that will help you as an organization be more agile. And very much it's an inspection and adaption. You're running mini hypothesis on these things all the time to see if what you're doing is gonna actually make an impact. So you need to constantly be assessing your results. And Peter Drucker, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So make it really visible and, and what you're actually measuring, why you're measuring it, and the, and the impact that you're expecting to see, the outcome you're looking for. So current value is the most important, but if you've got a product that doesn't offer value, it's not gonna last long in the marketplace. Measuring your uh, ability to innovate gives you insights that you're gonna need to remove those barriers, remove that technical debt, that time it takes you to actually get um, your product out there. Use experience as part of sustaining and improving. Um, getting engaged employees, getting happy employees, they're the ones that are gonna help you produce better, valuable products that people are gonna enjoy looking at. Improving value requires frequent delivery of new features, new value. So always think about that. Remove the impediments and understand what they are and what you can do about them to actually help you get faster in getting to market. And improving your organizational performance looking at your iterative process, looking at your cyclical process to see what we can improve each and every time, each and every sprint. And the EBM model actually provides you that holistic view of business agility for your organization. So rather than just thinking about one particular quadrant, try and think of a couple of measures in each of those and help track those along the way to help you understand what's gonna be good for your market pay. And celebrate the success, focus on in the improving results, take time to enjoy those things, take time to um, acknowledge them. And maximize the learnings that you've got around that and really building up the knowledge in your organization to make it a truly innovative organization. And that's the end, thank you. All the slides are in Config's engine but they're also on my blog as well. Um, but I think I've got two minutes for questions, maybe, if there's any. Okay. Oh, the template? There's a, um, oh, which template? The hypothesis-based delivery. So where you have the persona and the outcome and also the measure. Yeah. So I'm just more interested in that. And I also want to understand, uh, when you actually talk about the agile-based delivery and all of that from the requirements point of view, I see that it is more applicable for an epic or a capability level description of that, right? So let's yes. say, as a bank, I want to go completely paperless. So yeah. then you can say, okay, it can be measured through maybe the number of customers who are still visiting the branch and things like that, right? Yeah. Just an example. So, but how can that be expressed in the form of, let's say, further granular level, let's say, a user story level or something like that? Yeah, yeah, and that's where you take that sort of first example and then you use Jeff Patton's tool to actually take it from that outcome to the user story. Mm -hmm. So I. In the paper, I can point you to where that is, but it sort of sure. shows you how you can get that traceability from the goal all the way down to the user story. Uh -huh. um, and Jeff Patton's work's got a lot of patterns there to use. Patterns, patterns, yeah. Sure, sure. So we'll yeah. probably discuss after. Yeah, so yeah, let me, give me your card and I'll forward some to you from Jeff Patton. Okay. Yep. Um, anything else? I think we'll close. Cool, come talk to me later, bye. <laughs>